a story. And it's one that the media isn't telling. Um, I get really emotional when I watch that. Um, in, in the middle of that journey, I, uh, somebody reached out to my team and they were like, hey, you know, we have this thing going on in East Texas. Maybe you could come do worship. And, you know, at that point, I mean, it's a miracle I'm even here today. We did 27 U.S. capitals this year. Four nations. I mean, countless other endeavors. I'm, we're kind of tired. <laughs> um, but I'll never forget, you know, I got this, we got this message, and we just so happened to be in Dallas that weekend. And so I was like, well, we're, we're leading worship in Dallas you know, I, th I think it starts at 7, and I think it's going to go to like 8.30, and I said, we could maybe do the East Texas thing, but it, we wouldn't be able to get out here till 11, and they're like, yeah, let's do that. I was like, what? Y'all are going to do something that st starts that late? And so my team was, we prayed about it, and I felt like the Lord said, and I have a soft spot for East Texas, because when me and my wife, we... Uh, we lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to school at ORU, and, and, and we left to follow the call of God in our life. And the first place that we, when we left everything in Oklahoma, we drove down and met the kindest, sweetest, most hospitable people in East Texas. I, we ended up almost moving here like five times just because of the people. And, 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 so I, and then I began to research the history of this region and began to remember Keith Green and Leonard Ravenhill and the movements that had changed the world that came out of East Texas. And so anytime I got an invitation in ministry, I, always, I was like, okay, maybe God's up to something. And I'll never forget pulling up to this church, low expectations, and I walked around that field, and there were thousands of people out there at 11 p.m. People had their kids. And I remember thinking, these people are wild. <laughs> I, I called my wife. I was like, you'll never believe this. I was like, I, this, these are our people. They're up here at 11 p.m. worshiping Jesus in the dark night. And I felt like even that, my entryway into connection with you, was a prophetic moment where I saw the destiny of this church. In the midst of a dark night, there you were lighting up the sky for Jesus. And, and I want to speak into that. I want to, if you'll turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 12, I want to read this. I was in... Uh, I had, had a few moments in my life uh, where I've had these encounters with the Lord or these prophetic moments that really mark me. There's a lot of people, they have dreams and visions like, like we go to Walmart, you know. I'm not one of those. I get one every few years. The last significant one that I had was actually uh, the day that the virus, the first case of the virus was discovered in California. I'll never forget, I was sitting at home and my wife and kids will be here the next service. You'll see them. They're blonde-haired, blue eyes. That's the only kind we make. They're running around like crazy. Um, we were at home in Redding, uh, California, and the news came out. And I'm not a big fear-monger person. Like, I'm just like, whatever. You know, I mean, obviously, what we've done, I'm like, we're just going to follow Jesus. But something struck me when that first case of the virus came out. The Lord spoke to me, and he said, this is going to change the entire world. It's going to change how you do life. And the church's response to this is going to be the most important thing. And so I already knew that the true virus wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't COVID. It was fear. So that was the last time I had one of those encounters. Okay. Fast forward back three weeks ago. I had another one of those. And I was in Alaska. I was in Anchorage, Alaska in my hotel room. And the Lord gave me this verse Late at night, right before I went to bed, Hebrews 12 says this, verse 26, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. 
So this gives us the prescription of what we do in the church in times of shaking. This tells us what to do. Like, Christians should be the least surprised people on earth right now. I mean, it, it kind of blows my mind. I'm like, guys, <laughs> it's like an open book quiz and we got the answers. Like, we're not waiting for the media or a political pundit or whatever to tell us how to respond. We know how to respond, right? And so I love this because it says, listen, everything's going to be shaken. Someone say everything. Everything. Now, we're just in 2023 yet. Now, I'm, I'm standing up here with a little bit of clout because I'm the number one COVID violator in 29 states. Okay? I know what it's like to, to be shaken. <laughs> I know what it's like to be hunted down by Antifa, have blood thrown on us by Satanists. I have more fines. I still got fines that they want me to pay in all kinds of states. I mean, I have alliance defending freedom and first liberty or two law firms that have represented me. I mean, we have fought for the right and the freedom to worship. I have told numerous mayors, numerous governors, we worship God. We don't listen to you. And, and this is who we are, right? I remember I was just in the Capitol building. Uh, you know, we have a, a ministry place there a, a block away from the Capitol. And I was just there a few months ago in the prayer room that joins the Senate and the House, a prayer room that's very rarely used. And I was gathered with members of Congress and we were praying in that little chapel with communion saying, God, you're going to raise up leadership that's going to prioritize prayer in America again. Amen. Guess what happened last week? <laughs> the Speaker of the House walks, he starts his interview, his main interview. He begins the interview saying, let me take you all somewhere most people never go. This is the most important room in the Capitol. This is the prayer chapel. That's how he starts his interview. So God is writing stories and he's looking for a church that will not be rattled by the fear and the paranoia. He's looking for a church that understands we're going to make it through the shaking. And it says this, so how do we respond to shaking? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. This is why it's so powerful. We gather last night. We gather this morning in the midst of all that's going on in our world. Everything's being shaken, and we haven't even hit election year yet. <laughs> I mean, we haven't seen anything yet. There's new variants, supposedly, that are going to come. There's all kind of stuff headed our way. But it's so powerful for us to respond biblically in this season by saying, you know what? We don't belong to that kingdom. We belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and we're going to worship through it all. We're going to worship through it all. We're going to sing in the dark of night. And I believe that God is raising up, and, and I share this with you because, I mean, I used to live in Texas. I love Texas. I mean, ah, oh, it's like almost every day I wake up and I'm like, Lord, why you have me in California, please? I grew up as a Montanan. The one thing that unites Montanans is their hatred of California. And it's the hilarity of God that that's where I am. But what I see sometimes is that people in Texas can get very reaction, reactionary in their faith. And, oh, we're just going to hold it out and get in our bunkers and they're not going to come after us. And I'm like, no, 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 hold on, hold on. We belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is the hour to shine. This is the hour to praise. This is the hour to worship. This is the hour to attach ourselves to God's story. We respond in faith and not fear. Amen? And I, uh, you know, it, it's, there's no surprises. The darkness is going to get dark. A lot of people ask me, you know, Sean, is it getting darker? Is it getting brighter? Which is it? And I always tell people both. This is the end of the age. Both are happening, right? Darkness is going to get darker. Evil is going to get more prevalent, perversion, indoctrination, da-da-da. But guess what? Light is going to get brighter. 
And people are going to be so attracted in this season to what you are carrying. So anyway, back to Anchorage. So I'm in my hotel room. The Lord gives me this verse. He says, and I, I'm sharing a real prophetic message this morning because I just feel like this is what the Lord wants me to impart to you guys. But So everything's going to be shaken. So I'm, I'm praying this and I'm like, God, what do you mean? Like we have gone through a shaking. How much more shaking can we go? That night, a mile from my hotel, I kid you not, the largest earthquake in Alaska that year happens. One mile from my hotel. So I'm, I wake up and I get the news and the alerts and it's like all over my phone and I'm like, maybe I did hear from God. <laughs> that morning, 1,400 Jews are murdered from Hamas. And everything begins to explode across the Middle East. And if you're wondering if this story is going to go away, it ain't going away. It's unbelievable. I mean, what we are living in right now, it's like I, I, I joked last night, like I wake up and I'm like turning, which page of Revelation are we on today? And that began to shake. And then these corruption began to shake. And then several faith leaders that I love were exposed for, for, for things that were happening in their life. And it's just like over the last few weeks, it's been nonstop shaking, 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 shaking. And I feel like that the Lord is saying to us, which kingdom are you a part of? Where's your value? Where's your kingdom? Where's your security? Turn to Psalm chapter 2. I'm going to read Psalm chapter 2, and then I want to end on Psalm 24, and we're going to do something really special today. Just a few, a few comments on what's happening in Israel. God is faithful with his covenants. When he says... I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. He means it. And it's so important for us to realize what's happening. I mean, I, this is why I love bringing worship leaders and people from America and the nations to Israel because there's nothing like standing on the Mount of Olives. Like this is the real estate he's returning to. It's not up for debate. It says that his feet are going to hit the Mount of Olives. The middle of this catastrophe, no wonder why this war, this intensity, this, this darkness, no wonder why everyone wants to annihilate this tiny little strip of land because they know what's coming. <laughs> and when he comes back, he's coming from the east and he's walking through the eastern gate. And I love to get up there, you know, with my guitar and envision the moment. Oh, I live thousands of miles away. But every song and every prayer and every message and every tear is about bringing back a man to a physical place like it is happening turn to someone and say it is happening it's a great showdown of the end of the age and so it's no wonder that that is the place of the most intense warfare that is the place where every single nation around there wants to obliterate that's where he's returning to and the whole world's going to see him for who he truly is. I love this Psalm chapter 2. You know, we see this moment here where there's this great end time battle. And I don't know about you, but if you're flying in an airplane and you hit some turbulence, like really bad turbulence, I don't usually look around to see what other passengers are doing. I know they're going to freak out. I look at the stewardess. I look at if there's a, a you know an, another a flight attendant or maybe another pilot that's sitting you know waiting to jump on another flight. I look at their response. If they're not worried, I'm not worried. If they start freaking out, you should probably freak out. And I love watching because they do this all the time. They know the story. They, they you know they understand. And and here in Psalm chapter two, we have this scenario where the armies are coming against the living God. Where it's like it, this is the moment. And and for those of you parents out there, I have four kids. For those of you raising kids in this day and age, it is crazy out there. Just so you know, some of that video that you just watched, that video in the beginning, 
where you saw the rotunda and those three levels, that was in the Texas house in Austin. That was the moment where we were gathered inside of your state capital in a city that a lot of y'all probably don't have hope in. And we were gathered inside of there with your lawmakers in your state And we had four bills that were not getting passed in that legislature. And they all had to do with protecting children. And because they had a bunch of spineless conservatives, I'm just going to say it, that wouldn't stand up. They were being blocked. They weren't being passed. And so we brought them all in the middle. And we said, we're just going to worship in this place until we see God bring a breakthrough. They were all standing there in the middle. They had the bills in their hands. We prayed over them. Within five days, every single one of those was signed into law. So that's what's so important. You know, it's like, it's not like worship and prayer and gathering together and inviting the presence of God. Like, like this is not our last resort. This is our, our first response. I'm going to tell you, over this church in 2024, y'all are going to do a lot of worship nights. Can I get an amen? Amen. Y'all are going to do a lot of worship nights. And you're going to have an amazing perspective of God moving that maybe a lot of other churches won't have. Because you're not going to respond, be responding to evil, be responding to darkness. You're going to be leading with God's narrative. Psalm chapter 2, it says, Why do the nations conspire? The people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up. The rulers band together against the Lord. Uh, uh, Let us break their chains. Let us throw off their shackles. It's like the intimidation, the indoctrination, the fear, the paranoia, the demonic. It's an increase. It's, ah! I was watching my kids the other day walk on the beach in California. And I was just thinking as a father, I don't know how they're going to make it in this culture. I mean, we're so jacked up. Like, they, they don't even know what a woman is. <laughs> they don't know. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane, guys. Right? Anybody with me? And, and I'm just thinking, and I'm lamenting, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm just to be honest with you, like, I'm, my heart was breaking because I was just like, God, I wish they could, I wish they were born in the 90s. I wish they grew up in the 80s like me. I'm an 80s kid. You know what? 80s kids, we were different. My mom went in the grocery store. She kept the car running. You stay right here. I'm sitting in the car in Montana. It's negative 20 out. I'm like, Mom, what am I going to do? Look out the window. You know, 80s kids, we, we, were, we were something else, you know? And, 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 and I, I, I was lamenting this moment as my kids were walking. I'm like, God, I... You know, these four beautiful children that you've given me and they're walking into this crazy world that wants to destroy their innocence and wants to mess with their mind and wants to, I mean, I could go down the list, right, of all the things. And the Lord, he spoke back to me in that moment. He said, Sean, I have made and fashioned them for such a time as this. They have everything they need to bring the kingdom. And in that moment, all of the parenting fear was broken off of me. So we see this, the armies are are coming against the living God and they're plotting and they're conspiring and they're, and so, okay, I want to know what the pilot's doing. He worried. What's the pilot doing? Who's in control of this thing? Are they insecure? Are they worried? It says in verse 4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. I had more joy in my life in 2020 and 2021 than I've had in a long time. I'll never forget. I mean, the places God would send us into. And I'm like, Lord, like, I do not want to be a grumpy Christian. In fact, I think this morning here in Athens... I say we all just get free from grumpy Christianity. Where we walk around and we're always like, well, you know those crazy people in the government and all those crazy people. You know, it's just like we're always Debbie Downers. We're always like telling people how bad it is. And it's like, hold on, hold on. That is the worst marketing for Jesus ever. You know what was so attractive about our gatherings and why we had thousands of people? Everyone was afraid and we weren't. 
Joy is your weapon. Turn to someone say, joy is your weapon. Joy is your weapon. Joy is your weapon. So it says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. So the one who's actually in control thinks it's kind of funny that they could do anything. The position of the father is not worry or fear or insecurity. It's not like the angels are up there, you know, and they're like looking on the creator. And it's not like they're look they're looking to each other as they sing, holy, 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 worthy, 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 and their eyes are being burned out of their heads. And all of a sudden, one angel would turn to the other angel and go, I don't know if he can do it, man. It's getting bad down there. Y'all see what's happening in Texas? Woo! No. All they know is optimism. All they know is breakthrough. All they know is victory. Like, this is all they know. And this is what it means when the Bible says you're seated in heavenly places. This is where we reside. The more the world shakes, the happier we become. Y'all with me? So I brought an object lesson with me. I put on this. Well, I feel the anointing. I feel the anointing. Now, y'all might be like, you're from California. I don't like the Rangers. Listen, this is my jacket from when I was 10 years old. This is OG. My uncle is a season ticket holder, and he got this for me, and he gave, gave me this jacket. It has his name on it, Randy Foyt. And um, my first baseball game I ever went to was uh, in Texas, and I just remember it was so hot. I was 10 years old. I was like, these people are crazy. <laughs> and I've just so happened to have been in Texas over the last few, few weeks, and so I got a chance to go to game two of the World Series. Always been a bucket list. It was so stupid, the prices and everything, but a buddy of mine that blessed us and, and got me and my pastor friends tickets. And so we showed up to game two, and I don't know if y'all have been following this or this story. I mean, obviously you know that the Rangers are the only MLB team that didn't host a Pride Night. Come on. They're the only team that stood against the mob and said, we ain't doing that. They're also the only team that plays, I think, worship music like half the time during the games. I mean, it's amazing, right? And so it just was so fun to watch them beat team after team after team that they weren't supposed to beat. But we were there in game two, and game one, they, they won in the last minute. You guys remember that? It looked hopeless, and then bam, it was just this crazy thing. So we go into game two, and everyone is, is pumped, right? They're like, oh, we're going to take this, game two. They got annihilated. I mean, I, I just, I still laugh. I'm like, God, that's the one game I had to go to. I mean, they got their butts kicked hard. I mean, they couldn't hit. They couldn't pitch. I mean, it was like they forgot how to play baseball. It was embarrassing. They lost one to seven. And, you know, it's, it's always annoying when you're at, like, the team's home field. And then the visitors team fans are all, like, in your face, diving back. You know, they're doing all this. And I have never seen more depressed Texans <laughs> than when they left that stadium after game two. I mean, it was like, we barely won game one. We got our butts kicked in game two. They're, and they, everyone's losing hope. Oh, this is, it's over. It's going to be a repeat of 2011 when we were one pitch away. We've never won the World Series. We're one of the few uh, baseball teams that's never won it. We're not going to win. I mean, people were like, they went from like up here to brr. I mean, it was like crazy. It was like the hormones of, a, uh, of, of my daughter who's a teenager, you know? It's like, and I love her, but it's a different world. They came in so high. They were pumped. They were high-fiving each other. And all of a sudden, it was like three innings, four innings, five innings. It was like deep, dark depression. And by the end of it, it was like everyone was depressed and everyone was convinced they were going to lose every game. Imagine this, though. This is what I want to propose. What if they knew the end of the story before the game started? Come on. This is a word for some of you. What if they knew, okay, we might have a temporary setback. Those happen in life. 
but we know the end of the story. So even in moments of temporary setbacks, we can still be joyful. There was no joy in that stadium. What if they would have known that only three games later they would have clinched the first World Series in the history of Texas Rangers? They were unaware. This is a picture of the church in America. We have missionaries here. Prathap, stand up, wave your hand. This is my buddy Prathap from India. <laughs> India, in the next five years, will surpass China as the, as the largest church in the history of the world. 1.4 billion people. The church is just exploding. Some people believe uh, it's, it's at 5%. Other people believe it's already ballooned to somewhere like 8, eight 9% saved. The Hindu government keeps blocking the truth of how many people are saved and how many churches are happening because they're afraid of the uprising from radical Hindus against the church. Because so many people are getting saved, so many people are getting healed, so many churches are being planted, the gospel of the kingdom is prevailing across that nation. And we're hearing these stories, you know, our Light a Candle team last night sharing the stories of what's happening in, in Iraq, in the Middle East, when all you hear from the media is fear, but yet there's a, there's a greater story that God's showing. I mean, look at, look at even this, this crazy, look at Hamas, look at how evil and demonic they are, but yet God moved, touched through a vision, the son of Hamas is saved, and now he's preaching across America. Have you all seen that? He's at my buddy's church this weekend, the son of the Hamas leader. Nothing is impossible for God. Amen. Matthew 24, I want to read two more verses, and then we're going to do something. We're going to activate the Ranger victory anointing. So it says this in Matthew 24. And by the way, Matthew 23 to 25 and John 14 to 17, I believe are the most important passages for the church right now. It says in Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come on my name claiming I'm the Messiah. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Turn to someone and say, I'm not alarmed. We are this close to World War III. Y'all know that. Don't be alarmed. See that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginnings of birth pains. It's like, well, thanks, Lord. Thanks for the uh, great uh, forecast. But this is the key part right here. Verse 10. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will be betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Why? Because they are attaching themselves to the wrong narrative. The narrative of the kingdom and the narrative of the world do not flow together. Why? Because they're building their life, their theology, their family on foundations that will shake. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The end is not here yet. Why? Because the gospel testimony has not gone to every nation. We're very close. We're very close to every people group, every nation, and every tribe having a Bible-believing church represented in it. We're very close, but we're not there yet. But I love how he promises the gospel of the kingdom. Don't let your heart grow cold because I will finish what I started. And my heart today here in Athens is that we would be a church through the darkness, through the shaking, through the shifting, that we would be a people that worship. That we would be a people that praise. That we would be a people that put on. You know what this represents to me? 
the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. The garment of victory. I put this on knowing the end of the story. Knowing who wins in the end. Knowing that God is faithful to do everything that he promised. Over this church, over your life, over your community. And I feel like now is the hour for us to double down. The crazier it gets, the more we double down. We have 23 U.S. capitals to go. Y'all can pray for us next year. They're all the swing states. We're coming in hot, baby. (laughs) Ten days before the national election, we will be hosting probably the largest church service on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. We just filed our paperwork. October 27th, y'all can mark that date down, October 26th and 27th, there's nothing more that I want to do 10 days before the most important election in my lifetime than stand there worshiping Jesus with thousands of other wild people. Reminding ourselves and our nation, no matter what happens, we know who's on the throne and who's in control. And I believe this is the hour. I want to read one more verse. And if I could get the band to come up here, I want to pray this over you. Isaiah 61. By the way, this church and this band and this team is incredible. Can we just thank God for them? I I want to say this. I go to a lot of churches. Y'all don't know what you got. No, you really don't. A lot of you really don't. You just kind of walk in here like you don't know. There's such an incredible anointing in this house. I mean, just Pastor Mark, he was telling me the story of how this church began and how God called him here. And because I always, I just love how random God is. I'm like, why are you in Athens, Texas? I guess because God loves this place. What if he wants to use the fire and the worship? and the passion from this house to change the world? What if he wants to use you? What if, what if, what if as the nations rage, as politicians do what they do, what if this is the most joyful place on planet Earth? People battling depression and suicide and addiction, which is only increasing in America, And this just gets a reputation. You want to get free? You want to get joy? You got to go to that place. Right off the highway. Where there's nothing else around. For miles. (laughs) I was looking for coffee this morning. Searching up. Nope. There's nothing. But there's Jesus. That's why we're here. And, and, and God has such beautiful plans for this church and this house and you. And you know what? You guys are going to thrive in the days to come. Because you're going to be wearing the garment of praise. Isaiah 61, it says this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Someone say good news. Come on, give me that text that's a little bit more. Good news. Sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We just declare 2024 is not going to be a year of turmoil and hardship and division. It will be a year of the Lord's favor. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Why don't you all stand up with me? It's time for us to put on the ranger's jacket this morning. You may be in here and it may be like a game two of the World Series. It may be tough. It may seem hopeless. You may be battling stuff, sickness, issues in your family, issues with your finances. I'm telling you today, there's a garment of praise. 
There's a garment of praise. There's a greater narrative. There's a bigger God. If you're here and you would just say, Sean, I want to I want to pray for you and then I'm gonna invite Pastor Mark to come. But if you're here and you would just be like, Sean, if, if I'm really honest, I have been having that spirit of despair and spirit of heaviness. And man, I don't want to leave with that. I want to get free. I want to put on the jacket of victory. I want to remember who I am. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Come on, just be honest. Raise your hand. Come on, keep your hand up. We've all been there. This is what I want you to do. Actually, just put both hands up like this. I want to pray for you. <laughs> I, I just had this, this sense that this morning as I pray for you, like God is going to surprise you with such a wave of joy. A wave of joy that's going to shatter the lies of the enemy over your life. It's going to shatter the fear and the insecurity that's going to remind you who you are and whose you are. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are on the throne and you are in control. We thank you, Jesus, that you're moving across the nations of the earth. We thank you, Lord, that we belong to an unstoppable kingdom. We thank you, Jesus, Lord, that we know who wins in the end. And I pray tonight, God, that just like I put on this jacket, God, that a garment of praise would come over every person here. That it would break off despair. It would break off hopelessness. It would break off heaviness. And Lord, no matter the shaking that is to come, we believe Jesus. Lord, right now, Nobody leaves in bondage. Nobody leaves in shame. Nobody leaves in addiction. Say this after me. I put on the garment of praise. Victory is my destiny.